So you think that there could be some union between all the religions as Absolutely. part of Absolutely. We already have union, unity, but everybody's afraid from the terrorists. So this is our job to unify everybody to worship the only true living God uh, in the third temple with all the nations, all the nations that will worship God. Well, I'll ask in English. Do you believe that the Gentiles, the Goyim, will one day become the slaves of the Jews? So I believe it's, it's gonna, it's part of the Torah. Okay. Not a slave, like a slave today, the, we're like, a, we're gonna beat them and then they get, become a slave. They're gonna see how much the Torah, it's meaningful. Uh -huh. And they don't want the Jewish person to uh, work. So they say, we help you in everything and you learn Torah. It's gonna be... A it's gonna be a, a big, big world peace. Okay. So it's not, it's not and when is this going to happen? It's not, it's not the show today. Mashiach is going to come today. So the Messiah has to come? Of course. Okay, no, for it to happen, yeah. the Messiah has to happen. Yeah, yeah. You have to explain that. Ah. Uh, uh, are you going to say that the Jews will be the Jews on one day? Okay, it's written in the Torah. Okay, what ומה מה כתוב? כתוב בפירוש שהגויים יהיו עבדים שלנו? כן, כתוב אחרי ביאת המשיח, אני אומר, כתוב אחרי ביאת המשיח, אני לא יכול להביא את הפסוק המדויק, אבל כתוב שאחרי ביאת המשיח יהיה מלחמה מאוד מאוד גדולה, ובסופו של דבר כן, הגויים יהיו עבדים של היהודים במשך תקופה, ואחרי זה העולם יחזור כאילו לקדמותו. Paul said that Hagar and Ishmael represent those who were born under a covenant at Mount Sinai. And he said, just as then it is now, just as Hagar and Ishmael mocked and persecuted Sarah and Isaac, and remember, Abraham had to put them out. So it is now with the Jews and those who were born or those who are under the covenant of Mount Sinai. They persecute and hate those who believe in Jesus Christ and are free born. And so, as it was in Jesus' day, as it was in Peter and John's preaching, and as it was in the days of Paul, so it is now. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness. There is an incredible deception manifesting in the body of Christ. It's not a new deception, but rather one that is very old and resurfacing rapidly as the Antichrist nears. It's a deception that Jesus and his own apostles fought against. This deception revolves around people whose consciences are seared by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons those who are self-righteous, liars, and hypocrites. They are those who say they are Jews, but are not. There are also those who say they are neither Jew nor Christian, but are quote-unquote spiritual Israel, and are a part of this Hebrew roots movement. They state Christians must be obedient to Christ by obeying the old Mosaic law or Torah. Both of these false Jews and Hebrew roots converts seek to plunder the freedoms and liberties of Christians, and I hope to show you shocking evidence and prophetic scripture for why this is. 
Now, before we look at some of the recent events on the world stage, two important things need to be said. Number one, this video is not anti-Israel or anti-Jew. Jews who refuse to hear the gospel and those in the Hebrew Roots movement are indeed enemies to the gospel. However, regarding the Jews, Romans 11 states that they are beloved because of their forefathers and are against us because God has caused a partial hardening to come upon them until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Number two, anyone that's new to this channel who seeks to understand why Hebrew Roots is heretical and leads to spiritual death, you have a playlist of all my videos in the description box giving scriptural and parable references. We won't be going over these again in detail, rather the focus of this film is to show how Hebrew Roots, Jews, Muslims, and the world are being steadily guided into an Antichrist law, which is potentially going to be based off of the Noahide laws. Now, with regards to these seven Noahide laws, you may have already heard about them in the past couple of months simply because there has been a lot of activity or flurry around these terms. Most notably, it's being pushed by those in the Jewish Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism and the Jewish Sanhedrin. This is the legislative and judicial courts of the Jews. These are the same people that persecuted Jesus in the courts as well as the apostles. However, these Noahide laws or the system to implement them has been pushed for about the past three decades or more, at least from what we can tell. Now this snippet comes from Noahide.com. It says, To the Jewish people God gave the entire Torah teaching as their law. They therefore have a special responsibility with special commandments to be a priesthood of the world, a light unto the nations. The Bible says differently that Jesus Christ is our high priest and the saints will be a royal priesthood to him. But because the Jews are special, what about the rest of the world? What will God do for them? They state that God gave Noah and all his descendants seven commandments to obey. These seven universal laws were reaffirmed with Moses and the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, which is also known as the Oral Torah or Talmud, establishing modern observance of these laws goes on to say these seven commandments actually represent seven categories of hundreds of specific laws for non-Jews. Just like the Torah is 613 laws, then they apply the oral traditions, the oral Talmud on top of that, which has thousands and thousands of other instructions. But the key thing to note here is although you can deduce where the Noahide laws come from in terms of some coming from the Torah or the Ten Commandments, you won't actually find any reference in the Bible saying the Noahide laws. It's not going to list them out. Again, this comes from the oral traditions of the rabbis, the thing that Jesus criticized himself, the Talmud. And the ones who actually interpret the application of these laws is the Sanhedrin or the Jews themselves. So here you can see the seven categories of the laws. And at first glance, you'll see that, hey, they actually sound pretty reasonable. Don't deny God, don't blaspheme God, don't murder, don't steal, things like that. A lot of them sounding like the Ten Commandments. But again, you have to remember who's going to be doing the interpretation of this. It's going to be the Sanhedrin, the Jews themselves. And as we've seen in a lot of those prior videos, this is all going to be inspired by the Antichrist when their Messiah comes through. Not just the Jews, but remember, the Jews are expecting a Messiah. The Muslims are actually expecting their Messiah, the Mahdi. There's this tri-faith initiative trying to merge Muslims and Judaism and Christianity all together, saying that we have a father in Abraham that's probably going to be part of this deceit. But again, since this is going to be Antichrist inspired, you have to understand, looking at the first commandment, don't deny God, you'll see in future clips within this video, there are very prominent rabbis of the Temple Institute that are saying that if you do not believe in the God of Judaism, then you will be sentenced to death. Basically, if you support Christianity, if you support Islam, if you support Hinduism, Buddhism, you'll be put to death. You have to observe their God, which will be their Messiah, the Antichrist. 
I had said that the framework for these Noahide laws has been being built for the past several decades. You can see here from IsraeliNationalNews.com, there are also Noahide groups and communities all throughout the world. Significantly in 1991, President George H.W. Bush signed into law a historic resolution of both houses of Congress recognizing the seven Noahide laws as the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. In 2013, the UN also had a historic documentation supporting the seven Noahide laws. Again, this is from UN.org. You can see towards the bottom here, Rabbi Yaakov Kohen, head of the Institute of the Noahide Code, which sponsored this conference, said, On this day, people from all over the world gathered on behalf of the laws of Noah. Their observance is required so that the vision of the United Nations to have a settled and civilized world filled with the economic justice and righteousness will prevail. Just a couple years earlier in 2007, you have this document from the Vatican, Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, the delegation of the Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. They state that Jewish tradition emphasizes the Noahide Covenant as containing the universal moral code which is incumbent on all humanity. This idea is reflected in Christian scripture in the book of Acts. Now, you know that I've covered the Vatican a lot, and it is my firm belief that the elite in the Vatican and the Pope are somewhat like the John the Baptist of the Antichrist, and they are one and the same with the elite Zionists. And there is, in fact, a lot of evidence that the Vatican has wanted to control Jerusalem for quite some time. So all these things play together. Now, moving forward a little bit in time, we have our own President Trump being called on by the Sanhedrin to uphold the seven Noahide laws. This is from BreakingIsraelNews.com. It says, in an ancient and honored Jewish custom, the nascent Sanhedrin sent a letter to the new leader of the U.S., President Donald Trump, blessing him and calling him to take the lead in restoring America and the world. The Sanhedrin also called on the new president to acknowledge and uphold the seven Noahide laws. This here is from gutquestions.com, a familiar Christian site that many people use for research. And it says something very important, which I'm going to show you proof of towards the latter of this film. It says the Talmud, again, the oral written traditions of the rabbis, calls for the capital punishment for Gentiles who violate the Noahide laws. And this has led some to debate as to whether or not Christians who worship Jesus Christ are guilty of violating the first Noahide law and therefore deserving of the death penalty. This is a real risk. And so you start to see how this is all starting to form together. Now, if you think these Noahide laws are just some blown out internet conspiracy, I want to show you some ground level documentation that David from Round Saturn's Eye had collected when he was visiting David's tomb. Check out this letter. It says, we are Orthodox Torah observant Jews. We want to share with humanity the divine light that was imparted on us. The Jewish vision of redemption is universal and every non-Jew has the right to be illuminated. Nice word there. All you have to do is connect yourself to the eternal declaration of the Jewish people through Moses from Sinai. And what exactly does it mean? Observe the seven Noahide commandments and believe in the God of the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Later on in this note, it actually outright talks about Jesus as a type of anti-Messiah. So as I've mentioned, and as you've seen, these Noahide documents have spanned about three decades, but it really is, in fact, spreading at a rapid pace just within the last couple months and years. Now, I just want to share a short clip from Stephen and Jana. They are from Israeli News Live. They are both of Jewish descent, and they're very thorough researchers. You can see here that they both are very vocal about the dangers of the Noahide laws and how this relates to the potential beheadings, or the prophetic beheadings, rather. And yes. when we look in the book of Revelation, we see about the beheadings or the testimony that yes, they held, exactly. etc. That's so. one of the verses that is on our mind, that there will be beheadings. And everybody thought before, oh, it's by Sharia law, it's Muslims are going to do it, remember? Yeah. It's all Muslims are doing this. But no, it seems like, you know, of course there is a radical part of, of, of uh, Islamic faith, but it seems like Muslims have become the scapegoat for Zionists and for Orthodox Jews because they are the ones who are actually preparing beheadings. 
It's the Jewish people. And who, who was enemy of Yeshua? His own people. Now, this is a good place to show how this Hebrew Roots movement ties into the Noahide laws. Now, for one, I think we all need to understand the Old Testament. We do need to understand the quote-unquote Hebrew Roots. We can't fully appreciate the New Testament without understanding the Old. But we don't want to go back to the old. The Hebrew roots, deception, Torah observance, saying that we're going to walk like Jesus and follow the Torah like him, that he's pleased with us when we follow the Torah, that is a false gospel and it leads to spiritual death. But not only that, you're going to see at least two to three prominent rabbis in this film and how they are commending those in the Hebrew roots movement and loving the fact that they are following the Torah and they want them to become Noahides or convert to Judaism. And so just with the timing of this Hebrew Roots thing, it's, it's a very recent movement and it's spreading like wildfire and you have these Noahide commandments starting to spread like wildfire. You can see exactly what is starting to materialize here. So I wanted to share some clips of two prominent rabbis that are commending Hebrew Roots folks to become Noahides. Here you have Rabbi David Bar Haim, and he is the head of Machon Shiloh. You can hear that he gets this question often about what to do with those who want to follow the Torah. Should a Gentile who feels drawn to the Torah convert to Judaism or remain a Noahide? I have often been asked this question and I always mention uh, with regards to such a question the well-known case of Rabbi Eliyahu ben Amuzar. He had a student, a person who was very close to him, a non-Jew, who uh, very much wanted to convert to Judaism. And he, Rabbi uh, Amuzar ben Amuzar, convinced him not to do so. And he said, if you become the uh, ideal type of Noahide, you will be doing a greater service to humanity than by converting to Judaism. You will be a, a living example for others to follow that it is possible and it is also necessary and correct uh, and will have a great impact on the world. The next rabbi is a pretty prominent one. His name is Ira Michelson. He writes for Jews for Judaism, and he used to be a practicing Jew, then left and became a Christian. He was a Messianic Christian and was a leader or pastor of a congregation for 20 years, then completely abandoned Christianity and is trying to pull as many people out of Christianity as he can and into Noahide or Judaism. He writes in this article, that Hebrew Roots followers are rejected by Jews and Hebrew Christians, also known as Messianic Jews, and people don't seem to stay in the movement for very long. They end up rejecting Christianity while they learn Torah, moving instead towards Noahidism or converting to some stream of Judaism. Noahidism refers specifically to those non-Jews who observe the seven Noahide laws which all of mankind can use as the basis of personal morality. He is actually right about this. I have seen tons of people personally reject Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the fact that he is God in the flesh. And this all stems from just the progression of the Hebrew Roots movement. It starts innocently enough by insisting that the sacred name of Yeshua or Yahushua HaMashiach must be used. And then perhaps you do some clean and unclean meats and then the festivals and then the Sabbath that you need to have preparation day and it's from Friday at dusk to Saturday at dusk. And then you start to find yourself surrounded by a whole bunch of followers who then start to reject the Apostle Paul because they look at his writings and see that it is seemingly against the Torah. You see a lot of people, again, ending up rejecting the deity of Christ, saying that he only came in the authority of God, and it, it's just an apostate progression. He concludes by saying, we're all really excited about this regarding the surge of Hebrew Roots followers embracing some form of Jewish tradition. We are seeing a groundswell. Again, all these folks in the Hebrew Roots movement are looking to Jews 
as the holy people of God who have all the answers. But remember, it was the Jews that crucified Christ and persecuted all his followers, trying to bring them back under the law. Again, false Jews, those that are the synagogue of Satan. Now, the last rabbi that we're going to look at is probably the scariest one, Yisrael Ariel. He is the founder of the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Listen to what he says about the Noahide laws and the coming killings or beheadings for those that do not follow. So as I've showed you, you have to understand this is a real and credible threat that the Jews are in fact very sure that their Messiah is coming soon. And as we read the Bible, it says the Antichrist comes first and then Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, comes second. And so the Jews are literally awaiting the Antichrist. And you have to understand that the Antichrist is going to pander to the things that the Jews favor, the Torah, the Noahide, and how it all fits together with the persecution of the saints. Also understand, in Islam, there are lots of Muslims talking about how there are signs that their Messiah, whom they call the Mahdi, is coming as well. And a lot of Christian friends that I have that do Muslim or Islamic outreach say that there is a lot of similarities between Islam and Judaism. The reason for this is because Islam says their heritage traces back to when Abraham and the slave Hagar bore Ishmael. And then that is what Paul says are the sons of slavery that went into bondage. But then the child that came through the spirit of the promise of God between Abraham and Sarah, who was barren, and they bore Isaac, through that lineage we have the offspring Jesus Christ, upon whom the saints are redeemed. But because you have these roots in Abraham, there are a lot of similarities between the fact that Jews and Muslims have a very law-centric behavior. Now, I'd like to conclude with some prophetic insight that I've come to over the past couple of weeks. And it deals with a verse that actually a lot of Hebrew Roots people like to use to support their cause, that there is still a Sabbath that we need to follow, we still need to follow the Torah, etc., etc., it's in Matthew 24. I just want to read this for you really quickly. This is a chapter that is dealing with the end of days. Some folks think that this happened in 70 AD, but I disagree because if you look at verse 21, it says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not has been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So this is an end times event. And Jesus says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. That verse 20 is what we're going to be focusing on the most. 
For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So again, there is going to be this abomination of desolation event. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I believe that the Spirit will convict all Christians of exactly what it is when it happens. There won't be any mistaking it, especially for those that are in Judea or Jerusalem. And this event happens... People are going to be convicted by the Spirit to know that the time is now, and they're going to be convicted to flee and not even go down to get anything from your house, not your cloak. You're just going to want to flee, and it's going to be very troublesome for pregnant women. We can understand why. Being pregnant, it's very difficult to travel. If you have babies and you're nursing, it's very stressful, difficult to travel. And likewise, when we look at verse 20, talking about the fact that we are to pray that our flight not be in winter or on a Sabbath, let's explore that just as the fact that it's hard to travel if you have an infant or you're pregnant. Likewise, we can see that traveling into in the winter is very hard and difficult. But then it says, or on a Sabbath. Now, some Christians will think that Christians should be under the Sabbath, and then that's why it's written there, that we don't want to break the Sabbath requirements and flee from this persecution on that day, because then there'd be a conflict of interest. But Scripture rebukes that, because if we look at Matthew 12, verse 11 and 12, when the Pharisees are chastising Jesus and his apostles for potentially breaking the Sabbath, Jesus said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Oh, how much more value is a man than a sheep? So Jesus is even saying that a sheep's life is a value on the Sabbath, and you would quote unquote work to save that sheep. And our lives as men are much more important than that sheep. And being that Matthew 24 is spoken from Jesus himself, I'm pretty sure he's not talking about the Sabbath requirements being a hindrance of your escape. Rather, Christians, and I can say this categorically in my walk in faith and being strengthened, are not under the Old Testament Sabbath. It was a type and shadow which represents that Jesus is our Sabbath. If you don't believe me, you're going to go ahead and read Hebrews 4, where it talks about the seventh day being a day in the future where we find rest in him. Just as he rested from his works, so we rest from ours in Christ Jesus. And so Christians are not under the Old Testament Sabbath, carrying with it all the works of the flesh, such as preparation and not being able to travel and not being able to do work and not being able to carry sticks Rather, we should be setting aside a day or days of reverence to the Lord as we esteem. For as Romans 14.5 says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So why would Jesus lump the Sabbath in with these three other incidents that make it very difficult to travel? Well, let's just go back to Matthew 12 and see what type of issues Jesus and his apostles had to deal with on the Sabbath. In Matthew 12, it says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, if you look at the Sabbath requirements and breaking the Sabbath, the punishment can actually lead to death. And so you had these Judaizers that were watching their every move and were wanting to throw them into prison or kill them for breaking the Sabbath. And so imagine now in the end times that if there is an abomination of desolation event, that there's an antichrist that takes seat and is going to persecute Christians If there is a Sabbath that is taken hold of by the Antichrist, perhaps the Antichrist claims the Sabbath itself, which is from Friday at dusk to Saturday at dusk. That's what the Jews participate in. That's what Hebrew roots participate in. The Muslims, they celebrate quote-unquote Sabbath on Friday at noon, but still very close and same ideologies. If the Antichrist claims a day of worship for himself... 
and it is on the Sabbath, we can see how Judaizers can come back and start to persecute Christians if we are trying to flee on that Sabbath day, that they will try to behead us for doing things not lawful on the Sabbath. Now, this all might seem plausible to you, but still a little bit crazy. Maybe maybe you're not just really caught on this hook, line, and sinker. Well, let's just listen back to that very prominent rabbi, the founder of the Temple Institute, Israel Ariel, and see that he claims this very thing that I'm talking about. So that's straight from the horse's mouth. If you see someone on the street, again, if you're trying to escape on the street and this person is breaking the seven Noahide commandments or the categories and Sabbath is one of them and you have the willpower to kill that person, you are to kill them. That is what he's saying. And he's saying that this stems from the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides. This was a very medieval, Shepardic Jewish philosopher who became the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. And so Yisrael Ariel is saying that this philosophy doesn't necessarily come from him, it comes from Maimonides. And so this... Matthew 24 prophecy about praying that your travels not be on winter or on the Sabbath, specifically the Sabbath portion, it's starting to really look like that there is going to see, be some type of antichrist law where the Sabbath is in effect. And just as Jesus and his apostles were persecuted and being watched for what they did on the Sabbath, so too Christians will be watched especially if it's on this quote-unquote Sabbath day for the Antichrist. Again, there's lots and lots of puzzle pieces here, especially when you see the Middle East peace plan coming together with Kushner, who is a Jew, and Ivanka Trump, who converted to Judaism. Um, There is just a lot of the elite Zionist schemes going on here, and you can see how this leads to their Messiah, the Antichrist. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to come of this in the next weeks, months, and maybe if we have the time, years. I appreciate you watching this. Do subscribe if you haven't already. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness. God bless everybody.